So next, we have the pleasure of uh, hearing from Tyler Tringus, who runs Calm Fund. Let's give it up for Tyler, everyone. So Tyler is one of my favorite follows on Twitter, and he, similar to Jeff, is not afraid to speak his mind about what he feels about you know, the state of the current venture industry and is actively working to you know, build another model for funding entrepreneurs. So how about you maybe tell us a little bit about you know, what got you to here and what, what Calm Fund is doing? Sure, yeah. So I'm the founder and general partner of Calm Company Fund. Uh, we are an early stage investor in what we call Calm Companies. So we are an equity investor. You know, we're investing usually in very, very early stages, maybe like uh, 500K checks, that sort of thing. And uh, so in a lot of ways, we look like a traditional seed venture fund, um, partner with the founders, provide resources, mentorship, all that sort of stuff. But we have a very different strategy, uh, and it's around investing in what we call calm companies. Like you might think of it a little bit as like one of our initial taglines was funding for bootstrappers. So the idea being that there's a lot of uh, founders and a lot of opportunities out there that you know are technology, they're scalable, they involve software, but they're really not a fit for a true venture capital strategy. And there was no real capital partner for what was this kind of sort of huge market of entrepreneurs and, and opportunities. Um, I bootstrapped a B2B SaaS business myself and was like, hey, I would have loved to have had an investor you know, who would have invested in my kind of business. So after I sold my company about uh, five years ago, I started working on a fund uh, to partner with with these types of investors or these types of entrepreneurs. Really. Yeah. So, so you've written a lot about what makes a calm company. Yeah. Um, tell us about, you know, what are the features of calm companies? Yeah, it's a sort of intentionally inclusive definition. <laughs> um, so we're very happy for people to sort of take that term and run with it in a bunch of different ways. The way I mainly think about it right now is uh, building a calm company is around really cultivating optionality. Um, you know, entrepreneurship and investing in entrepreneurs is sort of full of uncertainty. Right? And one of the main ways we know to kind of combat uncertainty is optionality. So saying, hey, if I'm a little bit wrong about the timing or how quickly we can grow or how quickly we can pull in more capital, we're still not going to die. Right? We bake that model with some resilience in there. And, and that's really what it sort of boils down to for me. So in practice, that looks a lot like uh, I forget which slide it was, but in Jeff's presentation, like that whole laundry list of stuff of being capital efficient and you know, making more money than you spend growing at a sustainable pace, not burning your team out, all those sorts of things build a lot more resiliency into a business that let you stay in the game for the long term. So how do you kind of, um, you know, or, or I guess another question is, there's always going to be misalignment between investors and founders. Mm. Um, from what I understand from your writing, you've done your best to minimize that misalignment as much as possible. Yeah. Can you maybe speak to kind of like just more detailed, okay, what are those actual different incentives and how, you know, um, yeah, as, as investors, you're going to want to get X and a founder is going to want to have Y and how you've set up your fund to try to close that gap as much as possible. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think when you talk to most founders, I mean, you have the rare founder usually who maybe already has financial independence, either from something in their personal history or they've already had multiple successes. But most entrepreneurs are looking to have a really good chance at a really big outcome. They're not necessarily looking to have the smallest chance at the largest possible outcome, right? And so that's where the traditional misalignment that I think Jeff was talking about, yeah. you hear about all the time, which is you're kind of you know, trying to force the founder to keep doubling down and doubling down when maybe they've reached a point where it's like, this is a life-changing outcome for me. I'd kind of like to lock this up, you know? Um, and so, and basically that's like around thinking about the percent chance of success, right? And ultimately this is sort of baked into when you think about how you raise a fund, the business model is you kind of sell this thesis to your LPs and then you go deploy it. And so what we've done is kind of starting at the very beginning of that chain, do things a little bit differently. So when we go and talk to our LPs, we say, you know, we're looking to build a much more sort of normal distribution of outcomes. We're going to have, you know, some singles, doubles and triples instead of a bunch of strikeouts and one grand slam. And we have a bunch of you know, reasons why we think we can do that and the markets we're after at this moment in time. But it's about selling that distribution, which says, you know, we want to maximize the percentage chance 
that each one of the entrepreneurs we back reaches some level of serious success. And that will vary, but we're not going to keep pushing them to try and hit the highest possible outcomes, even when it maximizes risk. Yeah. Um, and so really that's kind of it, right? It's, it starts there, which is just what kind of portfolio distribution are you selling, right? When you go to your LPs, you tell them, we're going to build a portfolio that looks like this. And then you go and try to do it. And so it starts with that basic premise of these are the kinds of companies and the kinds of markets and the kinds of opportunities we're going to invest in. And then there's kind of a whole waterfall of stuff below that. Like a, a good example would be how we assess market size and market opportunities, right? Traditional venture, you want the largest possible addressable market so that you can have the possibility of a $10 billion or $100 billion outcome. We intentionally actually avoid the largest possible markets because we think they're going to be very, very competitive and have lots of capital flowing into them. And you're going to have a lot of winner take all outcomes and we don't necessarily want that. So we look for like much more kind of overlooked niches, which are still large enough that you can have really good outcomes, but you are not going to have this kind of like cutthroat battle of 20 companies trying to be number one. You just have one or two clear winners and the market's just not big enough to really attract either like big public companies or massive venture funds to kind of go after it. What are some examples of markets that you are focused on that fit that criteria? We do a lot of stuff. Uh, so right now we're really focused on B2B SaaS businesses and we do a lot of stuff in kind of like industrial applications, right? So, so you might see some overlap to the previous presentation, right? Where it's like, okay, we're going to do a blockchain for fisheries. Well, also B2B SaaS for fisheries would be something we might be interested in where I mean, fisheries is actually kind of big. That's maybe not a good example. Yeah. But like, you know, we, we've done some stuff in the, um, we did an investment recently in the food safety industry, right? And it's like, okay, you have all of these food production and packing plants and they're still doing stuff with um, their like safety protocols and health protocols with checklists and, you know, clipboards and stuff like that. And if you really do the kind of TAM analysis, it's very difficult to see how this could be you know, a $10 billion company serving software for this. But yeah, like they could build a really fantastic multi-hundred million dollar company. And if they're capital efficient and if they don't raise so much money along the way and they keep their valuation sane and they have the possibility to either build a super profitable company or exit to private equity or something like that, it can be a fantastic outcome for, for everybody, for their investors and founders. So, so you've made a lot of investments at this point over the five years you've you know been in business and... Yeah. Um, how often are you the kind of only investor or only institutional investor on the cap table or how often do they end up raising more money? So pretty often we are the only investors investing at the time um, okay. that we invest we, or it'll usually be either be just us or it'll be us and maybe some angels like either that the founder brings from their network or industry angels. Um, it's pretty rare for us to co-invest with other funds just because most of the funds that exist are sort of, you know, they, again, they, they've sold this venture capital strategy. And so we're often pretty rarely aligned with other funds. There's often, we're investing early enough that it's like, sometimes it's unclear, <laughs> right? What, what the opportunity is. So we'll find opportunities for collaboration with funds in that point. But frequently it's, it's just us. You know, we like to take very high conviction bets where we're not really looking for consensus with other investors. And, one of the things that enables that is that, you know, our model is not predicated on the company needing to continuously raise lots and lots of additional capital. So it interestingly lets us be more contrarian than a lot of funds that might even talk a lot about being contrarian because yeah. we don't really care what series A venture funds think about this market. If we like it, we think the company is going to be profitable and successful, we can, we can place a bet on it. Yeah, it's funny. There's, there's definitely a lot of, I'd say, overlap between how we do things at Unbounded and, and yeah. Calm. I think the, the main difference is just that rather than looking at a portfolio of industries that are currently kind of niche and overlooked where we can kind of invest just ourselves and be happy, uh, we're investing in kind of what we think is the best market of those all. And that is today maybe niche, but we think will be a massive competitive market in the future. Yeah. But as, you know, at this stage, the founders you're hearing from today, it's, you know, it's not over blooded with, with capital at least. Yet. Yeah. How do you think about that in terms of like, you know, so the way we address being non-consistent in that way is just, you know, the company is not, we pick companies that aren't going to necessarily need to raise more capital, right? They, they sometimes do, but they don't need to. Yeah. How do you kind of address the 
we, we have a mix in our portfolio. Yeah. So there's some companies where we feel like based on the revenues and the gross profit they have now, it's like very similar to Calm Fund where it's yeah. like, hey, um, it's probably best for us if you raise like one additional venture round at some point, mm -hmm. um, but you definitely don't need to to stay alive. And there's other companies where it's, hey, maybe the way they're using blockchain today makes them a bit more niche, but they're in like a you know big industry gaming and fintech such that if they get additional types of traction, mm. we feel like at that point, then lots of venture funding becomes available to them. Yeah. Um, but I definitely have a lot of interest in, in building a firm slash, you know, connecting firms like ours um, and hopefully other entrants that are at the later stage that allow for, you know, kind of non-consensus bets to be able to continue to thrive that aren't necessarily just those that are, you know, extremely capital efficient. Because while I think mm. for most businesses, um, you know, taking kind of the calmer company route probably makes more sense. There's still some businesses that just require a lot of capital up front before sure. you're going to see, you know, real revenue or even profitability. And I think from the way we think about the value of blockchain, we want to be able to make, you know, some of those bets as well. So it's, it, it's a mix. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's so freeing to be able to make these bets you know i think one of the things we're seeing in the market right now is you know this idea of like the seed stage series a series b and how is this kind of pass the baton thing where you always have to be sort of uh trying to gauge where the market is not necessarily what the fundamentals of the business are but what are the next layer of investors going to want to see right now you have so much uncertainty in the market that that whole food chain is just breaking down yeah. When I talk to like friends who are just like more traditional seed stage investors, they're like, we are not getting signal from Series A investors on what they want to see from us in 12 months. So we don't know how to place our bets, right? And it just becomes this very difficult kind of market to operate in. Whereas we're just sort of like, ah, it doesn't, hasn't really changed. I never cared what the Series A investors wanted to see in the first place. So, you know, we're just kind of continuing to deploy capital, um, even as like uncertainty has kind of like ramped up in the market. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so you've written a lot about, you know, not just why you think this is a good investment strategy, but why you think there should be more calm companies like in the world. Mm. Uh, can you speak more to kind of your, you know, non-financial motivations behind calm fund? Yeah, I think I want to see, you know, I think entrepreneurship is an inherent social good. I, a lot of my friends are entrepreneurs now. I think like they, especially once they sort of achieve a, some amount of outcome, they tend to be like very good societal actors. They give back a lot, you know. And I want to see more successful entrepreneurs. And, you know, I think it's easy to sort of like, uh, I don't want to be up here like bashing venture capital. I think venture capital is great, you know, and I think I, I really deeply admire when you have investors and entrepreneurs taking these true ultra high risk moonshot bets. But what I think happened sometime in the last kind of like 10, 15 years is we got this real misapplication or mismatch of capital and investing strategy with the opportunity set and what entrepreneurs want. And it kind of stemmed from like the, you know, maybe early 2000s software market where it was this very high risk thing to launch a website or, you know, when you needed two, three million dollars to launch your V1 of your iPhone app to even get it in the store. That was a real venture bet. You know, you were investing 500K in two people and an idea. You'd need to put millions of dollars before a user would even use it. You did need this kind of like moonshot mindset. But now all of the software and software enabled and internet economy, this like massive part of the global economy, is, doesn't really fit that risk profile anymore. You know, you can actually launch a lot of these businesses with very little capital or sweat equity. And also, like, the upside is not quite the same. You know, you can't really launch the next Salesforce or Shopify. You're launching kind of things that are going to either, you know, take part of their market share or going to build on what they've built on to be more incremental. And so a lot of these opportunities just shouldn't be taking this overall strategy. And I think it's sort of there just because there hasn't been anyone else stepping into this void because these companies are still you know, very asset light, you know, it's basically just people with laptops and code, you can't walk into a bank and get financing for it, right? There's yeah. no other partner for these folks. And so what we're trying to do with Calm Fund is to uh, lay out this strategy that's, that shows other entrepreneurs and investors a kind of better, more aligned path for what we see as like the vast majority of the software and internet economy. And so, yeah, I just want to see like a lot more companies succeed. Really, I've just seen too many great companies fail because they, you know, had this sort of 
original sin of, well, and I had this experience myself where it was like my first company I ever wanted to build. It was like, well, you know, I, I learned to code. I had this really cool idea for something in the clean tech market. I built a software product. Okay, I could use some money to get this thing off the ground. I don't know. I guess I should talk to VCs, right? They're the only people who invest in software. And it turns out like they were not a great fit for the company. You know? and, and I just see that over and over and over again. And I would love to build kind of a little bit more of a path um, for those entrepreneurs to just find success. Yeah. And, and, you know, I really appreciate Jeff sharing his, you know, story today. And there's, you know, there's hundreds of Jeffs out there that, you know, are not, don't have the privilege of buying their company, you know, for pennies on the dollar out of bankruptcy. And, you know, yeah. they could have had great businesses serving, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of people if, you know, they didn't, you know, choose the wrong investment partner. Sure. So, yeah. 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 Definitely with you on that. Um, and, you know, I, I hope, you know, as you stay here today, and hear from more companies like Hand Cash and Unisat that you've heard from. You know, we think a lot of these kind of micropayment, Bitcoin-enabled infrastructure tools, you know, even build upon kind of the suite of things available today where it's like, hey, you you know, you don't just need to charge $10 a month to get going. You could actually charge a cent from day one. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we hope that a lot of the companies here today also create a lot more entrepreneurs because it's an apparent, you know, societal good. So, okay. yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, going kind of more to calm, calm fund, we talked about this earlier and your, your letter made a really big impact on how I personally have kind of approached, you know, unbounded capitals management company. Mm. And, and you wrote a, a very kind of honest, vulnerable, you know, letter about kind of the, you know, beginning of calm funds now and the changes we've made. And, you know, it, the TLDR is that you made your management company of the investment funds and more calm company. So mm. just tell us about that journey and what made you decide to you know, make that decision earlier this year. Sure, yeah. I mean, the first decision I made was to make it slightly uncalm for a little bit. You know, because most, like the fund model, it is a lot closer to a kind of bootstrapper mentality. Like most funds are, are run as profitable from day one. In the sense that you go raise the fund and you get that stream of you Usually you put your costs below your management fees and you're kind of sustainable business you grow and as you as you accumulate more AUM and so it's, it's pretty close to that kind of calm company model. Um, as we were in the very early days, so four years in, um, we raised you know, some pretty small funds to just kind of prove the thesis and started to go really well. And I realized, you know, hey, like I think we have a huge opportunity here. <laughs> um, there's just tons of these companies out here. It is kind of one of these potential winner take all markets that we are kind of avoiding in our actual thesis, but we're actually operating in them. Um, so I, I had the idea to uh, potentially raise a little bit of capital for our management company to kind of treat it a little bit like a startup. So we cannot go too crazy with it, but to raise some, some basically some equity for the GP, the management company, uh, outside of the capital that we raise for our funds to scale up our team uh, and in advance of basically growing our it's a huge opportunity here. We're building all these tools and systems to be able to invest in, you know, to go from investing in maybe 30, 40 companies a year to investing in hundreds of companies a year. We're going to need a platform. We're going to need all kinds of cool stuff to, to make that happen. And we decided to do that ahead of actually having the, the AUM we would need to invest in hundreds of, of yeah. companies a year. Um, and it was a bet to basically say, hey, you know, I think, I think there's an opportunity here. And I think that institutional capital is going to recognize the opportunity and come along for the ride and will be totally ready, right? By the time we're ready to start taking on a two or $300 million fund, we'll have the team infrastructure, everything ready to go. Um, and we placed that bet you know, about a year and a half ago, two years ago now. Um, so we raised like about $1.8 million in GP equity for the management company, executed on that playbook the bet did not work out <laughs> in the sense that we built all the cool stuff and we were totally ready. We still aren't ready to invest in hundreds of companies a year, but I think I underestimated how slowly institutional capital comes around to a new thesis. Um, and so, you know, basically spent a big chunk of last year pitching everybody, you know, every foundation, every fund fund, every institutional and every endowment you've probably ever heard of. And they were all like, yeah, this is really cool. makes a ton of sense. We're not ready, you know, was <laughs> basically what we heard. Yeah. And, you know, things just moved slowly. And we were trying to pull the timeline forward. And we kind of, I just recognized, I don't think we can pull the timeline forward. I think we're just going to have to wait until the track record is sort of 
obvious um, and not kind of force them to make more of a, of a, of a uh, uncertain bet on us. And so we had to unwind that. So, you know, yeah. I am, a, I, I kept my kind of calm company ethos in the sense that I didn't, you know, go completely all or nothing. Um, but, you know, we, we were basically like a, like a seed stage startup. We were burning cash, right? We were taking some of that money we raised and we had grown our team to where every month we were burning down that runway. And uh, yeah, the first quarter of, of, uh, of this year, I had to make the call to say, you know, not changing the, the thesis or the plan, but being more indifferent to the timeline. Yeah. <laughs> so we needed that sort of thing to happen this year. And I just didn't think it was going to happen. So we, you know, scaled back the team, um, made some tough decisions on cutting a bunch of cool other things. We threw some really cool events that we had to basically cancel, all that sort of stuff um, to get us back to essentially like a break even operation, right? Yeah. Where we could be in the game doing what we're doing, you know, indefinitely. Yeah. And so I want to, as someone, you know, has gone through a similar path to yourself, uh, I want to just, you know, question the, make sure the track record is obvious because I've, I've also looked at your, your numbers and that so far it's a pretty great track record with some DPI. So is it, yeah. is it really the track record or like what, what are perhaps some of the other factors here? I don't know. I honestly yeah. don't know. You know what I mean? I don't know what I don't know. Um, uh, I was surprised, right? Um, you know, I thought, uh, I think, I think in, in, in large part, it's been a very weird market for the last, you know, 18 months. So in, in some respects, I've talked to a lot of GPs, um, who have all had trouble, you know, putting together like their, their first, second, third, kind of like their first institutional rounds. A lot of them thought they were like right ready to make that leap and then struggle to do so kind of regardless of strategy, track record, anything. Um, so in, in large part, I think it was sort of swimming against the tide. Um, but, uh, but yeah, we'll see. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> this is part of what I talk about, about kind of, you know, optionality, right? Yeah. It was like, I couldn't figure out a good thesis for what we needed to do to be able to 10x our AUM or bring in the partners that would help us do that. And so I felt like I needed to have a strategy that was resilient to my own uncertainty <laughs> on that front, uh, if that makes sense. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I got I got one more question I'll definitely ask and then we're gonna we're gonna open it up but obviously we can chat about this stuff for for quite some time. Sure. Yeah. Um, so we have a lot of LPs in the audience today, many of whom are invested in multiple VC funds. Mm. If there was you know one piece of advice you had to give them um, about investing in venture capital broadly, you know what would it be? Um. Hmm. I think that. The, the piece that you and I were just talking about, about looking for opportunities that are going to have a little bit of optionality there, where they're going to have the possibility to uh, become profitable or to become capital efficient, I think that's what I would still be looking for as an LP, right? So that's what I would be talking to other funds about is, you know, how are you going to place bets that are going to be at least somewhat resilient to this uncertainty in the market right now? Because I feel like outside of a few sectors, there's just this kind of broad based uncertainty around, does this model even work and what sectors are gonna be applicable and what platforms are gonna be, like there's just a lot of uncertainty right now um, in the, you know, the, the business of, of backing entrepreneurs, especially if you're trying to like create these like multi-billion dollar outcomes. And so I think that's, that would be something that I would be honing in on as an LP is looking for you know, managers that are addressing this and don't have their head in the sand on this. Yeah. 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 And, and as we've seen over the last you know year and a half or so that, you know, has been much, still not dominant, but much more a part of the conversation as sure. a result of, you know, market. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. On that note, let's give it up for Tyler. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, man. Yeah, of course.